and good evening everyone and welcome to segment two of our short series the Bi the <coughs> prison experiences of the Bible excuse me today we are in segment two of course and we are looking at the book of Jonah and the primary text of today's lesson is going to come from chapter one verses one through seventeen but we're going to find that we're going to be covering uh, just about the entire book of Jonah, uh, looking at all of the chapters. So we won't be reading all of this material, but we will be going through the material. So I want to start out by sharing a story with you that goes back to World War I. It has to do with a British soldier who had decided he was going to desert uh, because he was fed up with the war, he was fed up with the suffering, he was fed up with the death. So what he thought he would do is he would just desert, he would leave, he would go down to the coast, he will uh, catch himself a boat, and he will quietly make his way back to England. Well, it had gotten kind of dark this evening, and it was very dark outside, and uh, he found himself stumbling through the darkness trying to find his way at home. And he came across a, uh, it was pitch black, and he was lost. So he came across this sign that he walked up to, but he couldn't tell which direction to go. He couldn't tell what the sign says. So what he did was he decided he'll climb up and he got to the cross beam and he decided he was going to light a match and maybe he could see something that would help him understand or know where he was. So when he turned, when he lit his match, he basically saw himself looking into the face of Jesus, if you will, because what he had done was he had climbed up a, um, an outdoor crucifix. And he was stunned by what he saw, and he realized the shame in his life. And in his mind, he was, in his mind, looking into the face of Jesus. He was looking into the face of one who had endured it all and never turned back. And we're told in this story that the next morning he was back in the trenches fighting the war. And then we think about this and we think about ourselves and where we find ourselves sometimes. We know that God has an amazing way of getting our attention. He will call us to a task and the work that he has before us and, and we will draw back from him and what we will try to do is seek to go our own way. And when that happens, we find that God will come after us, if you will. He will come after us and he will pursue us until he brings us back to him and brings us back to the plan that he has for us in our lives. What we find is that when God has an assignment for us, he is determined that we will carry it out. He would just not allow us to walk away. He would just not allow us to do nothing. He will persistently, he will patiently uh, work with us in our lives until he brings us to the place where he can use us for his glory, where he can use us for his honor. And we'll find that he will do whatever he needs to do to get our attention and bring us to the place where we are willing to do what it is that God wants us to do. So this is one of the lessons that is taught in this book, in the book of Jonah. This prophet, we find he's called to do a work that God wanted him to do, but yet we find that this man ran away from God. But we find that God persevered, and he sent Jonah into a prison experience to get his attention, but not only that, to, to gain his cooperation. This prison wasn't constructed of bricks or mortar or even metal. This prison was constructed of flesh and blood. It was constructed of ivory, if you will. Yet it was in this strange prison that we're talking about here that Jonah was convinced, that Jonah was convinced that God's plan was the right plan. So let us pray before we look into this prison of perseverance. Heavenly Father, we pray, Father, that in those times where we find ourselves with the work before us and we are running away from it, Father, that... that we realize, Father, that you are indeed a persistent God and that you will continue to work with us, Father, to help us acknowledge our shortcomings, Father, to help rehabilitate us, Father, and to, to gain the results that you want to have in our lives. And, Father, we pray that during those times, Father, we do indeed grow so that we can 
come to the point, Father, where we can honor you and glorify you. Father, these things we pray and thank you for in Christ Jesus' most holy name. Amen. So let's go ahead and join Jonah in his prison, if you will. Now, when we look in this prison, there's a truth that we need to, to really acknowledge here. And the truth is this right here. Regardless of who we are, regardless of how strong we think we are, regardless of what we are capable of, that we can run from God and run from his will in our lives, yeah, but we cannot hide from God. We can't hide from him. And if necessary, he will send us into some type of a prison experience, if you will, so that he can get our attention and gain our cooperation. Now, there are some things that we need to know about this prison. First of all, there's a road leading to this prison. Second of all, there's rehabilitation in this prison. And thirdly, there are results in this prison. And when we look at the road leading to this prison, there are three things that, 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 that pave this road, if you will. Disobedience, disappointment, and disaster. When we look at the rehabilitation in this prison, there are three things that are gained there. There's acknowledgement, there's agreement, there is acceptance. And when we look at the results, what we find is the man is changed, the message is communicated, and the mission is accomplished. So as we turn our attention to the road to this prison, what we want to do is look first at the, dis the disobedience here. We look at chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3, and, and we're just going to go ahead and read that to get us going here, to, to get our minds wrapped around this. The Bible reads, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Abitay, Amitay, rather, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarsus. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarsus, away from the presence of the Lord. So we look here and what do we see? We see that God called Jonah to a specific task. Called him to this task. He was told to go and warn the city of Nineveh that the judgment of God was coming upon that city. God wanted to extend his grace to a lost and a needy people. But Jonah, on the other hand, he wanted no part of this. He, uh, God wanted to save the heathen people, as we see in, in chapter 4 at verse 1. But Jonah, on the other hand, he hated them. He hated them and he could have cared less if they died. He could have cared less if they, if they went to hell. So the question is, why did Jonah have such a, a deep hatred, if you will, for this people of Nineveh? Well, I'm going to suggest some reasons behind his thought process. Uh, now, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians were, they, they were a very fierce group of people. Uh, they were a warlike people. They were idol worshippers. They weren't Jewish. So you know, some people might say, well, maybe Jonah was racist. They were known for their cruelty to those who, who they attacked and who they defeated. For instance, just to show you how cruel they were, they were known to skin their victims alive and burn them alive rather and 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 and, and they would uh, uh I mean, rather they would they would skin them and they would impale their bodies on sharpened stakes and, and leave them to die or they will often fo force the parents to watch their children being burned alive just before they kill the parents and they were also known to bury their victims in the ground up to their necks and leave them there to to die of starvation or or, hung, or, or, or even thirst or even wait for wild animals to attack them and whole cities we find in history were known to commit suicide rather than fall into the hands of the Ninevites. And then what had happened now? This group of people, they had focused their attention on the people of God. They had focused their attention on Israel. It was common knowledge that they were coming. And they intended to destroy the people of God. So when Jonah hears the call to go and evangelize this particular city, he makes a decision. Now I'm going in another direction. Now he, the city that he was going to is located on the uh, western coast of Spain, some 2,000 miles in the opposite direction of where Jonah lived. And it was as far as he could go to get away from, uh, from, this, from these people than helping them. And Jonah thought he could escape God's plan. He thought he could escape the, 
the gaze of God by running away. Because in, in essence, he didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. So he ran. And when we think of Jonah and we think of the way he was thinking, we find that he had a very small view of God. He seems to think that God is a local God. He seems to believe that if he can run far enough away from God, that God would not find him. So it's fair to say that his theology was a false theology. In Psalm 139, at verses 7 through 10, God tells us very clearly just what he can see, he tells us very clearly where he operates, the ram that he operates in. At Psalm 139, verse 7, the Bible reads, Where should I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. So while Jonah has this small view of God, if you will. He thinks he can run. He thinks he can hide. Jonah thinks he can serve God when it is convenient, if you will. But when hard times come, or unpleasant assignments come his way, he thinks that he is free to abandon God and walk away from God's uh, call in his life. And you know, we can look at Jonah and we can come really, we can come down here on him really hard, man. How dare Jonah think like that? How dare he be like that? But then we come into this century. Do you not think the same way sometimes? Do we not think the same way sometimes? Do we don't mind serving God, in other words, when, when it's convenient, but when he tells us to do stuff that we don't want to do, well, we rebel. We disobey. We may not go to Tarsus, no, but we do go away from God. We think we know more than he does. We think we are in control. We think we can call the shots. We think we can do as we please. So let me just remind us all that when the Lord saved us, he took total possession of our life. But not only that, he, he owns us. He took total possession of our body. He took total possession of our soul. In the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 at verse 19, the Bible reads, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. God alone has the right to tell us what to do to tell us where to go, to tell us how to live our lives. And when he comes along with an assignment for us, what we need to do is fulfill it. All he wants to hear from our lips is the same thing he heard from the lips of Isaiah at chapter 6 at verse 8. At the end of that chapter, he said, Here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Anything less is disobedience. Anything less is rebellion. And that attitude will not go unchallenged by God. In Revelation 3 at verse 19, the Bible reads, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Jonah ran physically away from God, but he had already run spiritually. So I say to you, would-be elders, would-be preachers, would-be deacons, would-be teachers, and, and the flock in, in, in general do this all the time. But this is, there's something we need to know here, and this is it. It is not a badge of honor to say that I refuse to do what the Lord told me to do. There is no honor in that. God has been, if God has been speaking to our heart about something, then he wants us to do it. So the question is, are we obeying the voice of God? Are we doing as we please or are we going on our way and going against God's will for our lives? Yes, on this road, we do indeed find disobedience, but we also find disappointments. When we look at chapter 1 at verses 4 through 12, we see a good picture of that. We're not going to read this all that because we don't have the time, but let's just go and talk about this. When Jonah hits the road, right, things go well at first, and that's the way it normally is when we think we're getting away from God. Things seem to be going so well for us. But then he finds, he, so what happens? He finds himself on a ship. The ship was going in the opposite direction. It was going to the right place. 
This ship probably didn't come along but maybe once every six months. So Jonah was thinking like, yeah, I caught the ship at the right time. He was able to pay his fare. He got on board. He went to lay down. He figured I'd get a little rest. When I wake up where I'm going, man, it's going to be a nice cruise. When I wake up, I start a new life in a new location. Hey, man, I got it all figured out. But then the disappointments become start right away, you might say. Now, did you notice, when you go back and read that text, here's something you'll notice. You'll notice that Jonah is on a downward path when we look at verses 4 and 5. Now, if he had followed God's plan for what God had in mind for his life, he would have been used by God in a powerful way. His road would have led him upward rather than downward. We read that text and we find that, that he had to pay his own expenses. That you look at verse 3. If Jonah had stayed with the Lord, God would have provided for his needs. And something else. Did you notice that the captain and the crew soon found out who he was and they are amazed at the condition of his heart and his life when we look at verses 6 through 10. If Jonah's heart had been right with the Lord, he would not have lost his witness, if you will, and damaged his testimony before these pagan sailors. But something else you need to notice about Jonah. Uh, Jonah ended up in a place he never imagined being when we look at verses 15 through 17. Had he stayed with God's plan, he would have been in Nineveh preaching. He would have been in Nineveh enjoying a great revival. Instead, what is he doing? He's fighting for his life in a storm and having to go through, you might say, a great fish of a prison experience. Nothing was working here like Jonah had it planned. But when we bring ourselves here to, and, and think about us for a moment, the same scenario will play out in our lives if we choose our own path instead of the path of God. We will experience trials, we will experience tribulations, we will experience disappointments and hardships that could have been avoided. The Bible reminds us in Proverbs chapter 13 at, verses, at verse 15, the latter part, that the way of transgressors, trans, transgressors is hard. At Galatians 6 uh, verses 7 through 9, he gives us this word. The Bible reads, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So if the Lord has been calling us, then, any of us, to follow a certain pathway, the mindset should be we are going to go in that direction rather than going into another direction. But if we do go in another direction, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised when troubles and disappointments come our way. This road is a road filled with disaster. We see this in, in chapter 1. Uh, verse 4, we also see it in verses 13 through 17. But when we look here, we find that Jonah made his decision. He made his decision. He set his plan in motion. He boarded his ship. He set out for Tarsus. His goal was simple, to flee from the presence of God. I'm going to get away, as we see it in verse 3. But did you notice in verse 5? In verse 5, there's a simple little three-letter word that really gets us. But, but Jonah had his plan, but God had the final say. God first sent a storm to get Jonah's attention. And I'm telling you, this must have been a tremendous storm because even the sailors were terrified. And, and these sailors that we talk about here, these are, are weathered, they've weathered a lot of storms being out on the Mediterranean Sea. But they had never seen a storm like this one. And Jonah, when we look at verses 5 and 6, he, he was at peace with himself. He slept through it. And the sailors concluded that God is behind all of this. And they cast lots to discover who this vile sinner was. And Jonah was selected. And what happens? He is forced to confess his rebellion to a bunch of, of men who don't even know God. Jonah suggested they throw him overboard. Because he is the cause of the storm. But again, look at these men. These are pagans. They don't, they don't know God. 
But they showed more compassion for Jonah than Jonah was showing for the city of Nineveh. Because instead of just grabbing him and throwing him overboard, what do they do? They still try to save the ship. They still try to save Jonah. And we see this in verse 13. And only as a last resort, when nothing else was working, then they go, okay, we're going to throw him overboard. So they threw him in the sea. And when they do, the storm instantly stops. Verse 15. And what happened? God is using this event for a purpose. He's using this event to bring about the conversion of those pagan sailors, as we see in verse 16. So I guess it's fair to say when you get the backsliders out of your midst, you can have a revival. In the sea, Jonah finds himself swallowed alive by a special fish that God had prepared just for him. And he is in prison there for three days. You know, we, we read about this and there are people who will say, there is nowhere in the world that could have happened. That's just one of those stories in the Bible that somebody put there to try to get our attention. But we know that can't happen. Do you, can you prove it ever happened other than in the Bible? Well, yeah. In 1891, off the coast of the Falkland Islands, a man on a whaling boat by the name of James Bartlett actually fell overboard. And as he was bobbing up in the water, in the ocean I should say, he was swallowed whole by a huge whale. Well, about a day and a half later, these, this, uh, this crew on this boat, they uh, captured a large whale. And when they were going about the process of disemboweling the whale, they noticed movement in the stomach and they cut it open. And when you know it, they found James Bartlett. Now, his skin had been bleach white. His hair had been eaten off his head by the gastric acids, or juices, I should say. He was unconscious, but he was alive. He revived, and he was able to talk about his experience and what happened to... So, so I'm saying to you, what happened to this whaler? What happened to this whaler proves that what the Bible says is accurate. God did it with Jonah, and he showed mankind that it can happen. So one thing after another went wrong until Jonah found himself in a place of other helplessness. He thought he could battle with God, but he found that he was wrong. Just like we think we can battle with God and we find out that we are wrong. God knows how to take the butt out of us. He showed Moses that he could take the butt out of him because remember Moses, when we look at Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4, he had all these excuses for why he couldn't do what God wanted him to do. And God had an answer for each of those excuses. So regardless of what he wants us to do, regardless of what God wants us to do, our response should be simple. Just two words. Do it. Do it. If we rebel, we will find that that pathway that we're on will be filled with disappointments. It will be filled with disasters. God would not let us get away. He will pursue us and he will do whatever it takes to get our attention to get us to the point where we're going to do what it is God wants us to do. So I ask you, is God, just think about ourselves for a minute. Is God trying to get us to get you to do something? Is he calling you to a new ministry, a new work, a new something? Is he calling you for a deeper walk with him? Think about it yourself for a minute. Is he calling you to a new kind of work? If he is, my advice is simple. Stop running away from him and start running toward him. Yield to his will because he's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his mind. In Romans 11 and verse 29, the Bible reads, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. They're irrevocable. And I probably forgot to change the slide. No, I didn't. Okay. So, in this prison there's rehabilitation. Okay. Now this prison had the desired effect on Jonah's life. After he was placed there, the Lord began to effect the changes in his life that he wanted to have in his life. Now we look at uh, chapter 2, verse, verses 1 and 4, and verses uh, 7 through 9, we see Jonah's acknowledgement before the Lord. And that's what is, when we talk about disobedience, we need to acknowledge to God that we have indeed been disobedient. So out of that fish's belly, Jonah prays and calls on God at verse 2 of, of chapter 2. He turns his eyes, he turns his heart to God. And in the direction of God, once again, we see that verse 4. 
and he comes back to God and he actually praises God for, the, for who God really is and how God works. We see this in verses 7 through 9. And verse 8 seems to be a confession of his sin and his foolishness. So from the acknowledgement, Jonah turns to, we see agreement with the Lord. And that he says, I will pay what I have vowed. In other words, Jonah is saying this right here. Lord, I am through running from you now. You called me to be, to be a prophet and I will deliver your message when and where you tell me to. Wherever you lead, I will go. So here we're seeing then when we look at chapter 2, uh, verses 2 and, and 10 and chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we see Jonah's acceptance of what it is he has to do, the acceptance of God and the acceptance of his work. And we know that Jonah made things right with the Lord because God heard his prayers at verse 2 and God delivered him from his prison in verse 10. God renewed his call on Jonah's life and gave him a second chance to carry out his will, which, which we see in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Jonah paid a high price for what he did. He paid a high price for his, for his decision, for his rebellion, and he suffered greatly. He damaged his testimony because he had refused to walk in the will of the Lord. But when God got his attention... And that's something we need to think about. When God gets our attention, Jonah repented and made things right with God. And the Lord forgave him and restored him. And we should be praising God every day for this. We should be praising God that he always stands ready to receive his wayward children back to him. When the rebellious child of God comes to himself and, and comes clean with the Lord, God will forgive. God will forgive our failures. All he is looking for is a heart that's, that's basically willing to tell the truth. We see this in 1 John 1 at verse 9. We see it in Psalm 32 at verse 5. That when he finds that heart, he will forgive and he will put the person back in a right standing with him. So, again, we should praise the God that we serve. We should praise him. Because he is a God of second chances. And there's a person sitting in this room that cannot say, if we are Christian, that cannot say that God is a God of second chances. And if we are Christians and we have all sinned at least once since we became Christians and we have asked forgiveness, it shows again that God is a God of second chances. He just doesn't write people off because people mess up. But he forgives, he restores, and he uses them for his glory. Just look at Moses. He was a murderer, according to Exodus 2 and verse 12. And consider Mark. He abandoned Paul and Barnabas on a mission trip. We see that in Acts 15 and 38. But we also find that God restored him and used him in a great way at 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11. Look at David. He messed up in some mighty big ways. But still God used him for his glory. Then there is Peter. He denied Christ Jesus three times. And he was one of the most effective preachers of the gospel. He was a mighty preacher. You know, there are times when, when we fail God, and there are times when we lose our right to hold certain offices, yeah, but there, and there are times when, when our influence, if you will, with men is so devastated that it can never be fully repaired. And that's true. But there will never be a time. There will never be a time when the Lord will refuse to forgive his repentant children and to restore them to a place of fellowship. It is possible that we might not be able to do what we did once. Yeah. But there is a place of service for all who will repent, for all who will call out to the Lord once again. In this prison, there are results. When Jonah comes out, on, out of his prison, he is a different man. He is a different man. God sent Jonah in that fish to bring about a desired change or some desired changes in his life. And let's look at the results of, of, Zonas, of Jonah's rather prison experience. In that God's man, Jonah, is changed. At verse 3 of chapter 3, the Bible reads, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. He arose and went to Nineveh. That's a changed man right there because remember, at first he arose and went in the opposite direction. 
This time Jonah is not running from the Lord. He is running with the Lord. Jonah picks up his gospel trumpet and he heads off to Nineveh. And you know, if you think about the man James Bartlett that we just talked about that came out of that great, out of that well after a day and a half, and you think about Jonah was in there for three days, just think about for a moment what he must have looked like if, you know, if we, we think about it. Just think how he must have looked when he entered that city and he was preaching a message of judgment. Skin bleached, hair dissolved off his body from those gastric juices in that suspicious stomach. He was a changed man physically, but you know, more importantly, he was changed spirit spiritually. And that's how we are. We change physically, yeah, but more importantly, we change spiritually. Jonah is now on the Lord's team. And the message of God is being communicated. At verse 4, the Bible reads, And Jonah began to go into the city, and he, you know, go on a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah enters Nineveh and preaches the message God sent him to proclaim. And guess what? If you ever read this, we find that the people of Nineveh hear that the judgment of God is headed their way and they are evangelized. And God's mission, when we look at chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, is accomplished. When the people of Nineveh hear the message that Jonah is preaching, they repent of their sins and seek the face of the Lord. And the greatest revival in the history of mankind breaks out and an entire town is converted to the Lord. At least 120 souls, according to chapter 4, verse 11, were saved. It is estimated that Nineveh had a population of about 600,000. Sounds like Alaska, doesn't it? And just think, we have our campaign coming up in August. Maybe we can aim for 120,000. Maybe we can aim for 120,000. This event is a great demonstration of the power. It's a great demonstration of the grace of God in saving sinners. All this came about because Jonah was changed in his prison experience. And he began to go with God instead of going against God. When we get to a place where the Lord can use us, he would use us. After all, that is why he saved us from our sins, right? He saved us to be vessels of his glory. If we look at 2 Timothy 2, verses 20 and 21. He saved us from our sins to use us for his glory. He saved us to work for him in this world. Ephesians 2 at verse 10, the Bible reads, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God is looking for people he can clean up. He's looking for people he can use in a powerful way. Look at, look at the disciples, for instance. He took them, and, and in spite of their weaknesses, in spite of their failures, and in spite of their past, and he used them for his glory. That's every one of us sitting in here. We may think that we had it going on before we became a Christian, but if we, if we do, we were a legend in our own mind. That's all we were, legends in our own mind. Right here in this room, there are people who have failed the Lord and may think that your ability to serve him has been forfeited. But we're wrong in that. The Lord can restore you. He can bless you. He can use you if you would just heed to him. And go with him and his plan that he has for your life. We know that Jonah's heart was not made totally right. Because he, he was still mad. Jonah was still mad that the Ninevites got off the hook. He was still mad. He was angry. He was discouraged. He should have been praising the Lord for the work that God was done had done. But Jonah was still upset. And when the book closes, we find that that condition, that he was still in that condition. And it's fair to say, that was very sad. That was very sad. The prison of his perseverance. The prison of his perseverance can be a hard place to live. But it can be a blessing in, some, in so many ways. 
This prison reminds us that God loves us. We don't have time to read it, but I want to leave you with, refer you to Hebrews 12, verses 6 through 12, and read that when you get a chance. This prison helps prepare us for greater service. This prison can focus, if you will, our affection and set our hearts on God's plan for our lives. I want to share a story with you. And you know, some of us are like this sometimes when we think about it. Some of us are just like this. Well, his father had a rather strong-willed son, right? And they were on their way to the store, and the little boy wanted to stand up on the seat. And the dad's trying to drive, and the dad kept telling him, you need to sit down, you need to sit down, you need to sit down. The boy kept standing up, standing up, standing up. And finally, the dad made it quite clear, I'm going to do something really serious if you don't sit down and buckle that seat belt. So the boy thought, okay, I'll sit down and buckle it. Then the boy turned to his dad and said, Daddy, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. And that's the way we rebel sometimes. That's the way we rebel sometimes. Has God been calling you to do something for his glory? That's the question I have for you. Have you been taking a different path than his? Well, if we have, and all of us have at one time or another, I'm sure, today will be a great day to come to him and tell him that you're through running, tell him that you're through fighting, tell him that you're ready to go with him rather than away from him and against him. God speaks to our heart every day. I know he does. And he asks us to recommit. He asks us to recommit to a life of service to him. Are, you, are we listening to this? Are we listening to that? Well, I want to thank you all again for your attendance here. I ask you to please plan to be with us next week as we explore the third installment of our prison experience of the Bible. Next week, we will turn our attention to Jeremiah, chapter 32, verses 1 through 15, as we look at the prison of his purposes. Thank you. <laughs>